having lived in India, we have lived, you know, we, we learn to live within because we have nothing else to do. <laughs> we don't have any distractions. There's nothing. I mean, we have no stimuli of any kind, so the first thing we do in the morning is go to the tomb. We're so fortunate, that's true. But how about the rest of us living in the West? We have to find that island of peace within ourselves. Baba says, I'm with you always. I'm closer than your breath, just behind your thoughts. Therefore, he's always available. And he told Adi, when Adi was a young boy going to college, he says, think of me all the time. And Adi said, but how about when I'm going to college? How can I think of you and study for my exam and do my duties? Baba says, you take care of your duties in the world, and as soon as you're through, immediately think of me. So, we have to do that. Baba says we must think of him. We should take care of all our duties in the world, but when our mind is free, we should think of him. And especially at night, we do have the time. And usually we turn on the TV, as I said the other day, or we have some party to go to. We do have to take the time out for ourselves. That is for our true selves. Not so much for Baba. It's Baba said, you and I are not we but one. Therefore, when we're loving Baba, we're loving Baba in our heart, which is our true self. So if we want to live in the world, not be caught up in this constant stimulation, constant. I know this especially since we, I haven't watched TV for five years. <laughs> as soon as I get home, everybody in the family is turning on the TV, two or three TVs, you know. And, Oh, I have to go away by myself, go in my room. I say, all right, that's a bit wonderful show, but that's enough. Now I'm going to take time out here in the United States and find that time for myself, the quiet time. We have to do this daily, otherwise we'll just get embroiled, caught up in the world. That's all I can say. I had uh, a thought that occurs to me is that what Baba said to make him a constant companion and uh, join your mind with God's mind and by remembering him every day, every moment, as much as you can, then making him the constant companion, then that'll keep you in line. <laughs> Jay Baba. Well, if we're not of this world, what world are we of? <laughs> Seems to me that the question implies that we are of some other world. <clears throat> and I would say, of course, that it is Baba's world. And translated to our terms, it might be called the world of, of divine love and spirit. And uh, it's very appropriate to think of it that way because, as Baba tells us, in reality we are spirit. And uh, he even goes so far as to invite us to make our abode in and with him, even as we're going along in our everyday life. So this seems to imply that we make an effort, whatever we're doing, do it very well and uh, thoroughly, but somehow bring him into it. <clears throat> and he urges us to uh, be free of anxieties and be cheerful and uh, be confident, be confident in him and uh, feel secure in his love throughout every day of our life. And we can be free and be happy and uh, feel very secure in the sanctuary of his love. This is living in the world, but not being of it. Jay Baba. All of this is a discovery. And when I discovered that it is true that I cannot live without Baba, I found that Therefore, I cannot live for everything else. And I discovered this at a young age when the want machine was really all set to go in full force. So I had to make choices and discipline myself. Do I want these things or do I want Baba? And I knew I could not be satisfied or happy with all the other things. So I, I found I was forced into it because I needed Baba. And as I went to work and worked on the job, I found that if I place everything for Baba, then I know that it's he who is guiding me through all the events of my life. But I, I forget to give it to Baba 
and rely on his guidance, then I cannot say that it is he doing it. I might construe it that way, but it really might be me doing it. So there's a fine line of finding out whether it's Baba or you. And I, I thought, if you place it in Baba's hands, then you know that it is he guiding you through your workday life, your family life, through everything that happens to you, if you listen for his guidance. Well, I have a lot to say, but um, trying to get it into words. I think to live in the world and not be of it is one has to uh, try to keep focused on Baba. And the easiest way I know of is to concentrate on your breathing and uh, Baba is your breath, your breath of life. And if you find yourself um, in situations where you're not in balance and not thinking of Baba, you can concentrate on just breathing again and feeling uh, Baba's breath through your whole being. And another way is to take all of life as Baba's wish for you, even though you may not like some of the circumstances you're placed in. <clears throat> if you can be resigned to Baba's will and wish that uh, this is his will for you to help you with your karma and your sanskaras and to help you raise your consciousness and bring you closer to him. Jay Baba. Well, you know, I, in my last years of work, I was a game designer. And somehow that helped me a lot to uh, be in this world and not of it. <laughs> I, I think of, of the whole thing as a game that Baba's designed, you know. Uh, we can't get off the game board uh, too easily without his final grace. And there's certain rules we have to follow, but uh, it's a game and you play it, you have to play it, and uh, go through the whole little Monopoly board, you know. Um, but it's still a game, it's an illusion. I remember in Myrtle Beach one time, I think it was 56, we were all walking behind Baba and he suddenly stopped and turned and faced us and said, look into my eyes for one moment. And it, the whole place became still. It was very interesting that nature just stilled and we all looked into Baba's eyes. And I looked, I just lost myself in Baba's eyes and the whole, everything around me became, it dissolved into like whirling dots like a TV that's gone kaput, you know. <laughs> just dots, illusion, everything, except Baba's eye. And sometimes I, I think of that when I want to concentrate, when I'm in a place where I need some help. I, I imagine that I'm looking into those eyes of Baba and that kind of focuses on the reality behind the illusion. It's like that story of Guru Nanak, you know, he made this d disciple uh, carry a cup of milk. He said, if you spill one drop of milk off with your head. So he went all the way around. He never noticed anything. He kept his concentration on that cup of milk because um, otherwise he would have had it, you see. And that's sort of like concentrating on Baba in the middle of all this fun and games. I sort of like Maya. I, I agree with Margaret Krask. It's, it's fun, you know. I enjoy it. Actually, the only reason I'm up here is because Baba told us all to take a chance. Yeah. Um, the only answer I can give uh, of being in the world but not of it is to think of Baba every day, to love Baba, feel his love, and of course it helps working in a university. <laughs> okay, I don't work in a university anymore. However, <laughs> um, I guess I don't have anything original to say because there's nothing original when you come right down to it. So I do try and concentrate on Baba like everybody has said and also 
Um, when I have a real problem, I do more or less what Phyllis did, except um, I was told if I wanted to meditate, the best thing to do was look at a picture of Baba that's looking straight at you, which is the same thing as looking into his eyes. Therefore, you look into his eyes through the picture, and I find that helps a lot. I do find that I'm not altogether successful at work sometimes because I get very tangled up. I think of Baba before I start, and sometimes there's a problem with other personalities. I'm sure everybody has that. So when I meet those particular people, I try and think of Baba because of the conflict, and that does seem to help me um, a great deal. Jay Baba. <laughs> I think they've, they've answered a lot for us this weekend, at least for me, uh, in seeing them yesterday. But uh, what strikes me first about this question is thinking about Teresa of Avila, one of Baba's favorite saints. And you may know the story that is told of her that, um, or she tells herself actually, because she, she wrote it down, that she, Christ appeared to her and that was nothing too unusual in her life. She spoke with him regularly, and he came to her and he talked with her. Uh, and she said to him one day, she said, You know, Lord, you show me how beautiful you are. I'm thinking about it because of this weekend. You know, the, the beautiful moments we've had with Baba this weekend, and his presence has been so strong. Uh, you know, you show me how beautiful you are, how wonderful it is to be in your presence and yet you leave me in this world you know, I mean, we're all going to have to leave here today you leave me in this world why Lord why don't you take me with you why don't you just take me and let me be with you all the time and he looked at her you know with great compassion and, and he smiled at her. He said, Sister, he said, don't you see? If I took you with me, and you were with me all the time, then how could you serve me? And that struck her in the heart. And that, after that, she never again asked the question. She knew that she had to be in the world to serve him. He needs his workers, his servers, and the world. He doesn't need great people. I think we proved that this weekend, that we're not extraordinary or great. He could have had anyone. But he needs us because he's let us come into his orbit. We have to be in the world for Baba to carry out his work. He doesn't wave a wand. Hugh waves the wands. Baba doesn't wave the wand. <laughs> you know. and the work has to be carried out by human beings, by living, breathing human beings, and that's you and I, for better or for worse. And if we think we have all these things, you know, these problems and difficulties and so forth, how can we be worthy servants? It is because we have these problems and difficulties. It is because of who we are my mother told me this years ago, and I really never quite took it in, but now I'm feeling it more and more. She used to say to me, you know, Baba doesn't love me in spite of who I am. He loves me because of who I am. See, it's through all these things that we're working out. You may think you're, you know, you really uh, just aren't worthy, and this, but it's because of all those things you're working through that we are his servants, because he's also working on the whole world through those who remember him and are connected with him. So your working out of your problems in the world, your difficulties, is also part of Meher Baba's universal work. And that gives it a new meaning and dignity, as difficult as it is. And there's one thing I've learned, you know, this weekend, relearned, rethought. It is very difficult and painful to be in the world in this day and age. It is not easy for a lot of people. And I think it's so important that we say that and we not hide from that. 
and we talk about it. You know, there's a lot of things that people suffer and have to deal with that are very deep and very difficult things. And we shouldn't rush over them. We should face that. It's not easy. And, uh, uh, you know, the only way to deal with that is to be honest about it. Be as honest as we can about ourselves and about other people. You know, we need each other. But we don't need each other if we're going to just smile and hug and say Jay Baba and give platitudes to one another. We need each other if we're really going to be honest with each other. You know? Because Baba says, you know, spiritual freedom is what we're working towards. And he says that spiritual freedom can be attained by oneself for oneself. That's what it means. You walk that, you walk toward Baba, and you're, that's it. You're by yourself in a lot of ways. But then he adds, he says, but you can help one another. You can help one another, but you have to, you have to suffer with the person. You have to be compassionate, suffer with them where they are, you know. Be where they are, and every, and he even adds step by step. You have to be with the person where they are. You can't be somewhere else, looking down or looking over. And that requires real compassion. And it doesn't require you to be a saint. It just re requires you to be able to feel for the other person. And we have to do that for each other because the world is tough right now in the culture out there for a lot of people. It's easier for some than others, but I know there are a lot of people for whom living out there in the world is very tough. I know that. It's tough for me sometimes, too. Very tough. And the acceptance of one another, not a phony acceptance, but an acceptance of the other person as they are, like Baba accepts them. To me, that's what it means to be in the world, but not of it, because that frees that person just a little bit, gives them something to hold on to, something of Baba to hold on to. And so that's what I would stress now at the end of this experience this weekend. And really, I'm not saying this just from my experience or from me. I'm saying it from you, from what I've heard from you and felt from you, because I've heard a lot this weekend. I know I've talked a lot, <laughs> but I've also heard a lot. And one of the things I've heard over and over again is be honest, you know, and uh, accept yourself, uh, accept me as I am. Reminds me of that funny story, you know, that you probably know where Kitty and Anita were in the room with Baba. You know that story? And Anita's talking like she's, you know, she's wonderful, vibrant, talk, 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 you know. And then she leaves the room for a moment and Kitty looks at Baba and says, oh, Baba, why don't you tell Anita not to talk so much? <laughs> so we can just be with you. Just tell her not to talk so much. And Baba picked up his board and he spelled out, I like her the way she is. We have to, to accept each other as we are and go from there. doesn't mean we have to be self-satisfied, but there's no progress without acceptance. And that requires a degree of honesty that we don't always have with each other. If we're very candid about it. We don't always have it with each other. And uh, my brothers and sisters in Baba, we need to develop that honesty with each other. We knew we do. And not to hide it and just share. Yeah. And that will bring real harmony in the Baba world. Real harmony comes from honest acceptance and willingness to work step by step with the person where they are. Jay Baba. Willing to take uh, questions from the audience? How many are willing? Would you raise your hand if you're willing to take questions from? Okay. All right. Well, do you have? Uh, we'll take questions from the audience. All right, Jack.
Uh, did Baba ever explain why the women were kept in seclusion? And that Actually, he didn't explain it. Of course, I think he left many things unexplained, uh, so we were used to that. But uh, we did know that for many years, not only the women, uh, Mehramani and Maru, especially who were over here with Baba in 1952, but others as well were kept in seclusion and they lived uh, on Mehrabad Hill for a long period of time. And even some of the Western women were included in this group. Um, apparently, I mean, we can draw our own conclusions, but apparently this fit, did fit in with Baba's work, not only for the individuals involved, because uh, although uh, perhaps many individuals would think that what happened to them in relation to Baba was something special for them, it may have been far more expansive than that. And I think that this, this was the case with the uh, sequestered women, that uh, <clears throat> uh, you see, we, we see evidences of uh, the emergence of the importance of women in our world in, in every avenue. And this is a wonderful thing, and I think we can attribute this this uh, great achievement, and it's still not completed, it's going forward, uh, to Baba's intervention in the world and for his uh, work. And I feel that uh, uh, having the women in seclusion like that played a very important part in this. Uh, of course, obviously, I'm not able to measure the various things that might have come out of all of that, but these are some of the things. Uh, it also gave some of us an opportunity to not stare at women, <laughs> you know, <laughs> some of us men, <clears throat> to help make us conscious of the fact that uh, they're beautiful and we like to look at them, but uh, sometimes uh, we should learn uh, not to, you know. And so it may have had some value in that respect too, you know. So. <laughs> The, the image that comes to my mind is in 1962 when Baba had, as traditional in India, men were sitting on one side and women were sitting on the other. And this is an example of how Baba breaks things down in a natural way, as though he's not really, but later you realize what he's doing. I think that we have to think of thousands of years of tradition and habit and how the avatar breaks that down and changes consciousness is, of course, as Aaron says, we don't know completely, but we see the glimmerings. And that day in 1962, I'll never forget, because Baba, you know, had, the, had all of us men on one side and all the women on the other, which uh, for the East, of course, is how it is. So how is Baba to change the consciousness or begin to change the consciousness inwardly? Well, that he does, and outwardly, he gave a sign that he was doing it in this east-west gathering. It was very significant that it was at that gathering. Well, Baba said, kind of warm there on this side, the women's side. They've been sitting in the heat, you know, the sun coming right on the western women were sitting in front. It's warm. So Baba said, now you switch. You switch. You sit over here, you see, and the men sit over there. And so we did. And so then on one side you had men and women, on the other side you had men and women. And I felt that was significant. He, of course, used the Westerners to do it because it was natural for us. It was not difficult. But if you notice, the Eastern women have come more and more out into the world taking roles that they never would have dreamed. Mani in the trust office behind a desk, you see. Well, and gradually, even the Eastern women have taken new roles in the world, so that consciousness is being changed. The Western women all along took roles that were unusual for women to take. And Elizabeth Patterson alone is, is an example of that. Her role with Baba was very unusual for a woman in those days. Now we don't think it's so unusual. But in those days, to have a woman driving Baba around India, a woman doing these things, it was, it was quite something. And I think that I, I just wanted to add that to what Darwin was said, which is the, the heart of the matter. Baba is changing consciousness, and we see these little signs in the seclusion of the Eastern women and then the emergence of even 
his beloved Mara. See, the emergence of them into the world, into new roles, is extremely significant for the consciousness of our time. And I agree with Darwin that, that really it's now this, through the women taking new roles, that we are learning so much about Baba's new humanity and what it's going to be like. Do you have any helpful hints on how to make a marriage successful? Directed at the entire panel. Harry? Very, very succinctly. It's very simple. First of all, I think we were lucky. Secondly, secondly, I think you have to think of the other person first. And that's all. One thing that I'd like to add to that is that if you think of your love that you have together, that you share together, if you think of it as something very fragile that you have to protect and nourish so that it will grow for you, and you put that before your own self. Uh, about what I thought about uh, marriage and to make it successful, and I hadn't been able to have time to think it over and this one word popped out I said yield <laughs> All right, start. All right. well in in lieu of Manzili meme Baba has to work on our rough corners, you know, somewhere, somehow. <laughs> so we have to hang in there. <laughs> Let the old file do its work. <laughs> and not run off and say, this is too much for me. You know, we got to stay with it because Baba does his work with us where we are. And uh, <clears throat> if we're in a marriage, well, it's... it's um, an ideal place because uh, everything doesn't just go our way all the time, you know. <laughs> so we have to, as Jean says, yield. And sometimes we begin to realize that um, asserting our own opinion and our own uh, importance and uh, making our own point really isn't that important at all after all, <laughs> you know, that Baba is really trying to do something with us and we have to be sensitive to what it is he's trying to do, and if he doesn't succeed in doing it there, he's going to have to do it somewhere else, and so might as well keep your nose to the grindstone. But it isn't all bad. <laughs> you know, there are really some very nice aspects to being married. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I get the suggestion I better quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> I think that's well, when we first met Baba, he said to us, uh, through love, you shall see me as I really am. And I think that in marriage, you, you begin to uh, do that to, by seeing him within and uh, and not the illusory world or the things that we fight about, but to see the divine one in, within. And slowly but surely, uh, we'll see him as he really is. Virginia. Well, one word that stands out in my mind is kindness. And if you can be truly kind, to your partner, you're being truly uh, kind to yourself. And that in kindness includes love and consideration and accommodating the other partner. About serving, how do you personally go about serving Baba? Um. Well, I'll take myself uh, first uh, before I talk about anybody else. But I find that doing my job as best I can and uh, being very attentive to all the details of my job 
and loving the people I'm with is very important and that becomes, I think, an exemplar for the people around me. And that's the way I serve Baba. I was really appalled to see all this poverty and all this misery. And I just really felt so guilty that I had so much. So I asked Mani, how have all those poor people? I mean, how can I, you know, what can I do? Should I enjoy the comforts I have? Should I be happy with what Baba has given me? Or should I go up there in the slums and help everyone before I can get rid of this guilt that I have? She gave the example that everybody, we have compassion for everyone, and that we should help those within the atmosphere, within the area, arena of our family or wherever are the contact is within us. Like if we're in Arangaon, then we help. We can't go beyond our capacity. We can't go to Delhi or Calcutta or solve the problems in Africa. Just whatever is within our realm or of influence, then we do help. So now we have all these clinics in India, all these little things that we do, the workers there. So then I just say, well, I'm doing my best right here working with, with the trust. They have, it's clean. in other words, I do what I can within my capacity and I don't feel guilty because she said you cannot feel guilty about the beggars in Bombay. So you don't have that problem here. Here we have just, as she says, just give love to those around you and not so much that you're going to help them with food. Nobody's hungry here. But there it's a matter of, of, of food and, and shelter and all. So whatever is within my atmosphere or in my arena of, of um, acquaintance, that's where we have to serve. And then one time, I, this reminds me of it, and she told me the story, Mani did, that Baba was there with the Western women, and this one wo woman said, saw this beggar, and she said, oh, Baba, that poor beggar, oh, look at, you know. And Baba turned and looked at her sternly and said, do you think you're more compassionate than God? In other words, if you knew the background behind that man, he was a king at one time and he has to suffer this. It doesn't mean you should not be compassionate. It just means that since we don't know the karma, I'm talking about <coughs> India, which you can translate here. Since we don't know how to serve all humanity, Baba said, if you serve the avatar who serves the universe, then you're serving the universe through the avatar. I'm talking about us who living in India and the little service that we do there, that if I feel that if we serve the trust or help the trust, we're helping the avatar who serves the universe and we're serving the universe. I think the obvious is that we serve in our jobs, in our home life, our family life, our volunteer work, and I've run through all that in my personal life. But I think um, we serve in the little things, the kind word or the word that we withhold, the, the judgment that we withhold. And the things that we do as we go about our daily duties. I recall one time when I took my daughter with me on a shopping, you know, just grocery shopping and errands, and she was small. And after the morning was over, she said, Mommy, you were serving so many people that morning. And it was because Baba presented these opportunities for me to help some, someone ask me, well, how can you tell if a plum is ripe? I mean, it... This, the tiniest little things like that that just pop up at you all the time. And the other thing is to remember that Baba gives us these opportunities to serve Him, and it is our joy to have these opportunities to serve Him and to be aware of the increasing joy in our life. This is just a footnote to that, which is the real heart of the matter, but... Uh, I think the reason that I don't serve more, if I think about it, and I do think about it, 
um, is because I think of myself so much. And service, you know, I do a lot of things. I mean, I'm involved in hunger work and this and that. That's not necessarily service as we know. It's how you do those things. That's the difference. I mean, someone who doesn't do any of those things may be offering that smile or Baba's name in their heart to someone in the supermarket and they accomplish more than the person who gave thousands of dollars to world hunger or whatever. We know that. I mean, that's Baba's truth. So given that, then the question really isn't what kind of service we do. It's more how we do what we do every day. That's the real question. How do we do what we do? At least that's my question to myself every day. How do I do it? And I'm, I'm pretty aware that a lot of what I do isn't service, even though it looks like it. Because I'm thinking of myself. It's a habit. It's an old, old habit, Baba says. It's such an old, old, old habit that we cannot break the habit, even if we try. You know, we, we have good motive. We want to try. So Baba says, what to do, you know? He says, break the habit by beginning to love me in others, try to see me in others. Can you see something of me in that person? Do, maybe, you know, the profile, maybe the way they gesture, even if it has to be on a literal level at first. Begin to think and see and serve me in someone else. That breaks the habit that is an old, old habit. So, you know, we, we have the impulse to serve humanity, and it's good. But how we do it, how we do it is the question we have to ask ourselves, at least I do, daily. Now, Kitty doesn't ask herself that daily because she's a servant. In almost a deep archetypal sense, Kitty just is a servant. She's broken the habit, whether she knows it or not, but she has. She doesn't you know the reason that Kitty has so much time for people, and others marvel at how much time Kitty has for other people, is because she has no need to fill up her time with herself. She doesn't take herself very seriously anymore. Because really, she's broken the habit of thinking about herself so much. I'm not saying we shouldn't be self-aware. I've talked a lot about this this weekend, I don't, I'm, and I believe in that. But part of that is breaking the habit of ego-centeredness, even if it's about spiritual things. To always be thinking, well, you know, my life, my difficulties, my this, my that, is part of the old habit. Baba says, you want to break the habit? Think about other people. You know, serve them a little at a time. And Kitty is an example of that. She, she just has forgotten how to put herself first. She's forgotten how to think about Kitty all the time. And she doesn't take, if she has a difficulty, she doesn't take it that seriously. She looks at it, she deals with it, and she goes on. And I think that that is the clue, in my life at least, of how I can begin to be a real servant. And that doesn't mean doing something different than I've done before. I believe that I can do something about the hunger problem in the world. But how I do it is crucial if I really want Baba to use me to help the hungry. The how is the question. And as Virginia says, for me it may be the world's hunger problem. For you it may be the person that lives next door to you who needs your help. But whatever the opportunity that Baba gives you, if we're so absorbed in thinking about ourselves all the time, we'll miss all the opportunities and we won't break the old habit. At least that's how I feel about it. Our most outstanding example is Baba himself. Um, he didn't take any time out for himself at all. <laughs> From the very beginning to the very end, his very life was selfless service completely, every single instant, all the time. You know, Baba said that uh, one of his tasks in the world is to redirect the current. We probably read that and wonder how he's going to get to the power and light company or, or you know, how, what does that mean, the current, <laughs> you know? Well, actually, it's the currents within each one of us. We have electrical currents, and uh, I'm just simply rephrasing some of the things that Charles said, but in a different way, and it's nice to have different angles. This helps us to understand. 
And uh, these currents have been habitually directed toward what we would like to have, what we would like to do and be and all of that. But uh, the sad part of all of that is that uh, it's, it's a merry-go-round, and we just don't seem to be getting anywhere with that. <laughs> so Baba points up the possibility of um, a half year and for your life. You see, selfless service is related to love, and love is a giving, not a getting. It is a giving. One experiences fulfillment in giving. And everyone can participate in this. True, there is a difference between the ideal and the practical side of it. <clears throat> but wherever one is in one's work, if one can, instead of thinking about payday and, and I'm going to struggle through because I'm getting money, to try to find some angle wherein one can feel that one is rendering a service in one's work. This, this is a very valuable thing uh, because we, can, we have to live with our work every day or if we're house uh, bound as housewives are, the same way if we can have an attitude of, of serving, we will be encouraging the redirection of those inner currents. You see, we are me not meant to be self-contained in the sense that, that, that we're a receptacle. We're meant to be channels. We're meant to be open channels, and uh, <clears throat> Baba would allow, and is very anxious to have the current of his love and beauty and grace to flow through. So it isn't that we have to continuously think out, who am I going to go help and how am I going to do it? These are things that are very important. But to have an inner attitude, our attitudes are of very, very great importance. So if we ask Baba to help us to be a channel, and just have this attitude and be willing to serve wherever the, the opportunity presents itself, as in lit, the case that Litris points out. I often find myself going to a market or doing something for one purpose and discovering that I came there for something else. Uh, maybe to tell someone how to get somewhere or to pick up something from the floor, open a door, some tiny little thing that seems of no importance at all. But then I realize that's really why I came here. It was an opportunity. So these are the things that that uh, are extremely important in, in our lives and in Baba's lives, life because it, uh, with us because it opens up. It opens up the heart center and it, it can give us a sense of fulfillment that we could never get in any other way. Any of her thoughts with us? Since I've been ill, I've had time to think about things. And I, I think um, when one gets ill, it, uh, it shouldn't be taken as a, a punishment or anything like that. It's an opportunity for one to uh, learn detachment from one's physical form and from the life of Maya, and while you're ill, you can um, just let your life force flow to Baba and receive his life force through you, and it raises your, your vibrations so that you shouldn't take illness or physical suffering or even emotional suffering as a, a punishment because it's actually an opportunity to grow spiritually. We can take another question, Georgine. Techniques you use to remind yourself of Baba in the midst of everything. I had this ring made with Baba's name, and I can look at it 
like when I'm driving on the freeway with someone who makes me real nervous. <laughs> I look at Baba's name and I put this tiny little diamond chip in there to remind me that of, of the spiritual light somehow, Father. <laughs> so it's just I get so caught up sometimes in, in this outward and, and then um, confusion. I just get deeper and deeper into it and suddenly I realize how painful it is, how terrible it is. I've got to get out of this. So I just yell out, Baba, Baba, Baba. And then I just um, have to stop, like Renee says. If I'm alone, or even if I'm with someone, I'll just take, take a deep breath, and I'll say, he's just closer than my breath, and, and if I can't stop, my mind is going. The, the breath will quieten the mind, and I'll just take deep breaths, and um, eventually, and just say Baba with each breath, because Baba did say that in, in one of the articles. I don't know where I read it. I'll find it. If you take a deep breath and just say Baba, as it goes in and Baba, as it goes out, it'll quieten your mind. Because ba God's name is God. So if you call on Baba, you, that's God. And if he will come and help you because he's right there, just behind your breath. It works. Practice, practice. Uh, and everyone has to find their own way to practice, especially in a way that's genuine, that's not uh, habitual in the superficial sense of just doing it to do it, but to find a way to do it from your heart. And it's easier to do it from your heart if you consciously decide you're going to practice, 